Welcome to episode 20 of the RSA Resident and Student Podcast Series, a production of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. RSA is an accessible, collaborative organization that fosters innovation, education, and advocacy for residents and students in emergency medicine. In this episode, Dr. Shanna Ross, Education Chief at the University of Illinois and a former RSA board member, speaks with Dr. Kevin Rogers, Professor of Clinical Emergency Medicine at Indiana University and President of AAEM. Today, Drs. Ross and Rogers discuss navigating your career in emergency medicine. Hello everyone, my name is Shanna Ross. I'm one of the chief residents at the University of Illinois Chicago. I'm also one of the board members of AAEM's resident student organization. I'm here today with Dr. Kevin Rogers, who is a clinical professor of emergency medicine and the program director emeritus at the Indiana University. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about navigating your career path in emergency medicine. Great, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So let's start out. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career in emergency medicine? Yes, it was uh, not exactly a direct career. Because prior to going to medical school, I had been a paramedic and a PA. But once I landed in San Antonio in the Army program at Brook Army Medical Center, I was lucky enough to actually have my first, or actually have another mentor get involved in my life, Carrie Chisholm, who's pretty well known, a previous president of SAEM and president of CORD. And certainly he, I think, had a lot to do with pushing me towards academics. So what was it that made you decide to go into academics? You know, it's funny because with my background as a paramedic and, you know, a PA who flew on a helicopter in Atlanta, it would be a natural progression to go to EMS. But I figured out that really being able to impact residents and teach residents was really my passion. And I think that's what a lot of people need to remember when they're thinking about their career. Inside, in your heart, what is burning? What is your passion? Because I think that's what you need to really continue to focus on as you look at the different paths that people can take in emergency medicine. What are some of those paths that people take in emergency medicine? A good example is everybody is constantly thinking about fellowships. And I think the one thing to consider is that fellowships a year, two years, some longer, three years, that it does impact your financial stability. You know, think about the fact that you could have had a full salary emergency medicine job during, let's say, three years, right, that would be probably close to about a million dollars out in the community. And with the type of loans that people are coming out with, that really impacts that. You hear a lot of people say, I have to have a fellowship to go into academics. And I just don't think that's true. I actually used to have uh, debates that we put on at SAEM between chairs. And the last one I had, John Ma from Oregon and Don Yealy from Pittsburgh debated it. And the interesting thing is, if you, you know, require everybody to have a fellowship to come into an academic job, that does raise the level of sort of academia within that group. Because no matter what fellowship you do, you know, whether you do talks or EMS or whatever, it includes training you in research, it includes training you in statistics and your ability to interpret the literature, and it gives you a somewhat of a higher professional development level. So you do bring all that to the job. But the problem is, is that chairs only have so much protected time to give out. And oftentimes now when people arrive with a fellowship, they're told, you know what, I hired you because you have that training and you're a higher level academic person but I can't give you any protected time to do what you just trained to do. So that's why I say passion, again, has to be at the root of your decision whether you would ever want to go do a fellowship. You have to say, I absolutely don't think I can exist in the emergency medicine world without doing toxicology. And so people need to make that decision because, as Don Yealy said, I, in my job, I believe I also have to have clinician teachers. I can't just have people who are fellowship trained I need those clinician teachers, right, that are also on the ground every day working in the ED and teaching people. And they're contributing academically also, but just, you know, with a different background. And as you might imagine, those people can also supplement their training with things like the EMF Teaching Fellowship or the EMF Research Fellowship, where it's not a complete fellowship. It's four weeks out of a year where you have to go and do that training. So, you know, whether you decide to go to a community job or an academic job or whatever, or to a fellowship, I think you should think about what is my real passion? What would I like to do? Gotcha. 
So besides the passion, let's say you've decided you wanted to go one path or another, what are some key things that you need to consider during these paths? So let's say you're going to a community. You decide, you know, I want to go to a community job. You have to understand that who you work for may be important. We kind of at, obviously at AAEM, we kind of support that democratic groups where physicians are in charge of their destiny within their group, and the operation of the group is completely transparent, that that would be the type of perfect practice that we would try to push people to. And of course, we know that not everybody can work for those groups. And there are certainly democratic groups out there that call themselves democratic who are not necessarily completely democratic. So you have to keep that in mind. You know, some people may have to, because of geographic limitations, they may have to go to work for a corporate medical group. And, you know, that's just what you have to do sometimes. But you have to go into that knowing all the potential downsides. As most people already know, most corporate medical groups, when you sign the contract, there is a clause in their contract that says you're waiving your due process, which means they can fire you at any time they want, without any kind of a hearing and without any even real reason. Many of them still have restrictive clauses in their contracts, which say, if you decide to leave us, you cannot work within 100 miles of this facility, meaning you would have to potentially move away, you know, and take your family and your kids out of school. So people need to understand that working for a corporate medical group has some downsides. Probably the biggest thing that people need to realize is that this is a business for them. Let me say that again. This is a business for them. You're being controlled in your practice by a non-physician, number one. Number two, their goal in life is to make money for their investors. So they are taking money away from physicians every day to be able to make money for the corporation and to pay their investors. So you are not really getting the full reimbursement that you deserve based on your work product. So I understand that sometimes people have to go to work for the corporate medical groups, but people need to know what they're getting into and what some of the downsides are. But I think the other things in community that you need to look at is, do I want to be in a rural area? Do I want to be in an urban area? Do I want to be in a big community practice? or a small community practice. And let me just give you one example. In a small community practice, you often are working alone. So there's single coverage in that emergency department. It can get kind of lonely. Whereas when you're working in a large group at a large volume ED, there are often two or three or four attendings that are working together. You have somebody else to bounce your ideas off. You have somebody to go talk to when you have that really exciting case. Um, and the other thing that comes into play in that small group, if somebody gets sick, you're probably going to be working a lot of extra shifts, whereas a large group can really absorb that easier. But then some people say the advantage to a small group is there's, you know, it's easier to control and be transparent with eight people than it is with 40. So there's upsides and downsides to even looking at where you might practice out in the community. So that's the community side. What about on the academic side? I think, again, you have to decide what, what the department looks like what the focus of the department is, because a lot of departments have a different focus. You know, some are very, very much strictly research. We're going to do research, 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 right, and become the best research department in the country. As you can imagine, if your passion is more towards I want to be a good teacher and I want to be on the ground with the residents, that may not be the perfect place for you. But if you're somebody who goes, my whole career is going to be built around being a researcher, that would be a perfect place for you. So I think you have to look at the department and what their focus is and make sure, just like you do when you're choosing residencies, make sure you investigate the department and that you understand the nuances of the department in terms of their focus and direction so that it coincides with your passion. So again, the, I know the word passion has been used over and over, but the bottom line is, as I always say to, you know, to medical students when they're looking at residencies, that there is a perfect residency out there for every medical student. There's a perfect job out there for everybody leaving residency, and you have to research it just like you would research where you went to medical school, where you went to residency. You have to do due diligence to make sure you know when you're looking at an academic job that it will actually allow you to get a niche area and kind of practice your passion. With that being said, you know, how do you find these out? Do you just ask to see the mission statement? Is it just talking during your interview? Absolutely. Any excellent department is going to have a mission statement, and they're going to actually be able to tell you each of the pieces and where they're going. Oftentimes, they'll have a mission statement and a vision statement. 
And those things, obviously, they're dedicated to that. They formulated it, and it will tell you a lot about that department. I think you had told me this before, but you always said there's three things that you can get in a job. <laughs> so this is a, a quote from one of my faculty when I was in the Army. He said, you know, there are three things. You can make as much money as you want. You can live where you want. And you can work as hard as you want. But pick two. So <laughs> it just demonstrates that it's really hard to find the perfect place. But I do think you can get pretty close. Now, do you have any last words of advice or... Do you have any one thing that you wish you knew from the beginning of your career that you could impart onto the residents and students of RSA? You know, I was very lucky that early on in my career, I discovered AEM, to tell you the truth. And with that, there were some early people, Joe Lex and Bob McNamara come to mind, who served as my mentors. And so I had the opportunity to grow up in the organization from the very beginning, you know, and it wasn't too much longer after AAEM started that I got that opportunity. So I kind of got in on the doorstep, if you, you know, as they say. And I've had the focus of the organization on each individual person. When you're looking for that kind of mentorship, you can't find anything better than that. I had people that would sit down and mentor me and talk to me and help me with different things as I was growing up in the organization. And I think that had a tremendous impact on my development in both within AAEM and within my own job as an acmedician. Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers, for taking the time to discuss this with us today. You bet. I'm, I'm so excited that I got an opportunity to do it. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed this podcast from the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Resident and Student Association. For more information about RSA, please visit our website, www.aaemrsa.org. Listen to all podcasts in this series and explore the ways you can get involved with RSA. Join us again next episode for another topic of importance for emergency medicine residents and students.